and reminded, reminded that some of us stubborn ones, arrogant ones, need a loving slap upside the head. And that God does that because he loves you and he wants you and he wants to reclaim you for his own. And now we're going to transition to Mr. Tucker Johnson, who's going to come up and read some scripture for us, get us going in the book of Acts chapter 9. So why don't you stand with me? Hey, Tucker. Good morning. I'll be reading Acts 9, verse 1 through 19. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, as suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was, he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And, at he, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales from, fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. You may be seated. Awesome. Thanks, Tucker. Good job. So last week, um, if you weren't here, um, we're going through the book of Acts, right? Last week, uh, we saw this picture of Philip coming alongside the eunuch, which was essentially God bringing someone alongside a heart that was ready. It was a Holy Spirit-led moment where this guy who was really wealthy, powerful, influential, was actually empty inside and was just primed and ready for the moment where he was going to hear about Jesus. And, and, and he, as Philip sort of described the scriptures to him, there was this immediate revelation of who Jesus was and this immediate response and said, I'm in, right? It was just like this one, two, three, great, I'm in, let's do this. This is resonating. I'm going to get down right now. I'm going to get baptized. And it was such a perfect setup and alignment for this heart that was just ready to receive. And this week, we're going to look at this chunk of scripture, right, that we see someone who is hard-hearted, someone who is completely blinded by pride, who's heard about Jesus many, many times before and totally rejected him. This person has intent Incredible intent to oppose everything that has to do with Jesus. This is not just the person who's like, um, oh, you're into Jesus? That's cool for you, man. Whatever works. You know, everybody figure out your own way. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't even like that lackadaisical, like whatever. This person was actually intensely opposing the work and the people of Jesus. Not just anyone, but, but Saul of Tarsus. 
And this was an important moment for several reasons. One of them was that Jesus entered in to this moment and overrode the laws of nature and stepped directly into this man's life. He's like, I got this. Boom, and just went in. That's a, that doesn't happen all the time. It was also important because it was an inflection point in the early church where there was a whole set of possibilities and things developing and dynamics that were happening. And this was a flip into something new, a new season of, of, of expansion and growth and change in the early church that was foundational for even the church that we know today. And that was the final idea that was jumping out to me, which is that it was important because it opened the door to immeasurable fruit from then all the way until now. So we're coming into the scriptures in this specific moment and way, and it's an important one. It also includes a normal person like you and me. And as we read the narrative and see their role in this, it's helpful and encouraging, providing some rich learning for everyone in the room, no matter who you are or how long you've been following Jesus or how, whether you view yourself as a spiritual midget or a spiritual giant, there's something for us to take away here as well. So let's pray before we dive in and see how an enemy becomes a brother. Father, we come to the scriptures humbly and we invite you to teach us and to speak to us and to change us. There are still things we need to learn and grow in, ways we need to be sanctified. So we pray that you would do that here this morning in a way that goes beyond what's normal and natural, something your spirit is doing in us and in our church. Open the word to us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 1 says, But Saul, still breathing threats of murder, threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if found, he could if, sorry, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. You know, amazing stuff, right, is happening in this early church. Miracles and transformations, the birth of the Christian church is happening. But mixed into all those miracles is some intense struggles and suffering and, and, and challenges and murder and threats to them. There's all kinds of intense things happening that's testing everyone as they respond to Jesus. Back in chapter 8, and in verse 3, it says, But Saul was ravaging the church and entering, this is what jumped out at me, entering house after house. This wasn't a thing where he just walks along the street and looks for people. He actually busts into their house and removes them from it. What an intense like, reality to live under in Jerusalem, realizing that if you're a follower of Jesus, there might be a day coming soon, and you've, heard, and you've heard stories and had friends whose house were just opened up and they were taken from their house and imprisoned. And it says he dragged off men and women. You know, in this culture, it's, it's patriarchal. And, and if, you, and if uh, uh, the father or the leader of a home says, I'm going to follow Jesus, what that meant inherently was his whole household was going to follow Jesus. And so if, when you're trying to oppose something or shut something down, it's pretty effective just to grab dad and take him and imprison him. But Saul's doing something different. He's taking men and women it's incredible because his intensity, his disgust toward this, this followers of the way is, is causing him to go way further than he needs to without in regards to children. He'll go into the house, he'll grab mom and dad and just leave and leave the kids there for the community to figure out and take care of. This is an intense pursuit and, a, and a, a, an attempt at eradication. Like it's not your normal situation. And he has these letters from the high priest. Have you ever wondered how having a letter from a high priest will give you authority to break into people's homes, arrest them, and remove them to Jerusalem? Have you ever wondered how that worked? Like, how come he's got these? It's not like a little note on a post-it, right? He's got something. You know, it's interesting because the reality is in our country, the legal system is pretty homogenous or uniform. It's all the same system, right? There's state courts, there's federal courts, there's your local superior court, appellate courts, and then there's the state supreme court, right? And there's, there's the same thing in the federal um, sense where at the, at the top of the heap is the supreme court of the United States. And in this time where they lived, 
there was a mixture of legal systems that they could interact with at any time. So you could, if there's a legal issue, you could interact with the Jewish court system or you could interact with the Greco-Roman court system. And the thing is, even within the Jewish court system, there was different flavors of that based on the kinds of groups and sects and, and different ways that people address that. So you could actually find the court that's most you know, sympathetic to your case and take it to that one. Because in Jewish law, there's you know, the, the, the Mosaic law. Then there's the Talmud, which is the, like the interpreted law around that. And then there's rabbinic, rabbinic law, which is like the, lo, like the most recent or um, contemporary set of teachings from the rabbis that were there. And so there's all these different flavors in the way that they're interpreting things. So you, if you wanted to go into the Greco-Roman courts, this is super geeky. I'm sorry it's so boring. I just had to go. I just had to go there. Just stay with me. I won't be here for too long. The court systems of ancient Israel, you know, but you, if you wanted to get something done in a Greco-Roman court, you got, went to a scribe and you got it written up in Greek. And if you wanted something in the Jewish court, you went to a scribe and had, had them write it up in Aramaic. Okay, so the point is this. The Sanhedrin, you've heard of the Sanhedrin, right? This is that Jesus and the Sanhedrin and the crucifixion and all that. The Sanhedrin is the Jewish Supreme Court. Okay, that is the, the greater Sanhedrin and Jerusalem is the Supreme Court for everything. Okay, and that includes Pharisees and Sadducees. Sadducees are these really conservative Jews who read everything as it is. When you die, you're done. There's no afterlife. There's no resurrection. There's no angels. There's none of that. Pharisees are sort of a more lax, uh, well, Sad Sadducees would call it a more lax interpretation of it. And they believe in all those things. Okay, so the the Sanhedrin is the Supreme Court made up of a mixture of these different Jews. Technically, they had lost the ability for capital punishment. How do I know that? Well, back when Jesus was being you know, brought to the authorities in John 18, verse 31, Pilate said to the Jews, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. And the Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. So there's this legal game happening. It's chess. They're trying to move the pieces to get what they want to accomplish, which is they want a public execution of Jesus. So, all that being said, how did Saul get letters from the Supreme Court in Jerusalem? Well, Gamaliel is a name you may have heard before from a previous chapter. Do you remember Gamaliel? When they were asking the believers in Jerusalem, not to speak anymore in the name of Jesus. And then they arrest them, and then they kept talking, and they arrest him again. And they were about to rake him over the coals. There was one of the members of the Sanhedrin who stood up in Acts chapter 5. It said, but a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in high honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a while. And he says, guys, if this is from God, it'll live. If it's not from God, it won't live. Right? You remember that? That's Gamaliel. Okay? He's one of the primary leaders on the, on the Supreme Court, the, the Sanhedrin. Gamaliel is Saul's rabbi. Okay? So Saul, from when he was young, has been sitting at the feet of Gamaliel, who's on the Supreme Court, okay? who's on the Sanhedrin. See, in Acts chapter 22, when Paul, it, Saul turned Paul, is saying, I am a Jew born in Tarsus and Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel in the strict manner. He was... He was a golden boy. That's what I'm getting at, okay? Saul was connected to the highest courts, the highest forms of authority among Jewish culture and religion and people, and he knew all those people. In fact, his mentor was one of the most influential people on that Supreme Court, okay? So he was able to get, essentially, opinions, written opinions from the chief justice on the Supreme Court to walk into these other towns. He's like, look, I hear all the Christians are running away from Jerusalem, Great, I'm going after him. Give me these letters. And he was able to politically maneuver that and get the letters that he wanted, and he headed out for Damascus, 150 miles away. That's like uh, having to get from here to South Bay, okay, say San Jose. And the majority, I know that a lot of times when you think about Saul getting whacked out there, you, you see pictures of him on a horse, you know. There's no scriptural evidence he was riding a horse, but most 
common form of transportation was walking. So it's most likely that Saul was walking from here to San Jose. Okay, It's like a couple weeks journey if you make good time, if you're used to walking like that. Verse 3, now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, who are you, who, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. And the men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Most of the time, God uses other people to introduce himself, right? So many times it's someone like you or me standing up and saying, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. But sometimes he makes his own introductions. And that's an intense experience to go through. <laughs> so he says, Saul, Saul. It reminds me as we go through some of the scripture reading for the year, I was in, we've been in Genesis, if you're doing the Old Testament part of it, but there's several times when God says this to people. Another one, he says, Abraham, Abraham, repeats his name twice. He also says, Jacob, Jacob, when he calls Jacob. He says it to Moses too. He says, Moses, Moses. Have you ever had someone say your name twice to you? Sometimes my wife does it to me. Ryan, Ryan. And I know it's time to listen up. You know what I'm saying, guys? Sometimes when you, you can remember your parent, maybe you're younger and your parent says your name twice like that, and you're like, okay, I'm listening, I'm listening. This is God's way of saying there's something intense happening, there's something going on. Listen, Saul, Saul. Jesus is still doing this today, by the way. He's still introducing himself to people directly. There's a lot of stories going on. I gathered some of them from uh, some missions, some frontier missions organizations. And listen to this. There's a ministry happening uh, near, before I say this, do you know that Muslim, Muslims who are converting to Christianity, 25% of them are converting because of meeting Jesus in a vision or dream on their own. Did you know that? Because they're so far beyond reach of anyone, Jesus is like, hey, so I'm going to visit you tonight in this dream. Listen to this. There's a ministry that's working in Muslim area, and there's a, there's a Muslim, older Muslim woman who is totally unreceptive to the gospel, but it really appreciates the help and assistance she gets from the ministry. She's coming, and she's totally just like, yeah, just give me the food. One day she comes, and it's closed, okay? And she sits down on the street, and it says the door is closed, but a light came to her like started to approach her on the street and a voice said to her, my daughter, my daughter, the door is open for you. Come. And she replied, the door is closed. And again, the voice called to her. I am the son of God, Jesus. The door is open for you, my daughter. I am the door. And she kneeled on the street in front of this place and gave her life to the Lord. And the next day reported this to the ministry that she had been visiting so many months. There was a Persian man who showed up at 6 a.m. at a ministry camp saying, during the night, someone dressed in white raised his hand to get my attention and said to me, stand up and follow me. And the Persian man said, who are you? The man in white replied, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the way to heaven. No one can go to the Father except through me. This man had never read those scriptures. He'd never read a Bible. He'd never heard those words. When he came to the camp and said them, they opened their Bibles and said, it's Jesus. And they read him the words. There was a family on a boat with other migrants traveling from Turkey to Athens. Overloaded boat. Their seven-year-old daughter got bumped and fell into the water and they couldn't find her. Suddenly she appeared on the, on the other side of the boat from the one she was on. Saying over and over, a man who walked on the water took me and brought me to the other side of the boat. And her parents dismissed these words as silly. Upon arriving at the island of Lesbos, a, a, a Christian made a fire and offered to talk to them and felt specifically led by God to ask them if they would like to know about a God who walked on water. The family all wept and me, on, it began to weep and gave their hearts to the Lord. Jesus is still introducing himself to people on his own. Verse 8, Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. 
So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was out without sight and neither ate nor drank. You know, some of us, I'm going to put myself in this category, some of us hear the truth and do not accept it. Blinded by our own pride. In some of those cases, God has to just smack people upside the head. Where are my people at? Anybody like that? Yeah. Okay, you were, there's a tribe of us, right? Um, we're those kind of people. Um, and I, I was one of those kind of people when I, when I was young. I was so arrogant, and God had to do something to wake me up. And so my first encounter with Jesus, um, I was at a, like a teen camp, and this guy that I'd never met before on the platform st- stood up and started giving details about my life that he could never know. And it started blowing my mind. And I decided, as God totally undid me, began to undo me, to respond. And as I responded, I entered into a, a waking vision and was visited by Jesus. And you're like, okay, I was visiting today. I'm going to leave. You know, um, I know it sounds crazy. Um, it's what I needed to respond to Jesus. There was no other way I was going to say yes to him. And uh, about... Yeah, apparently about 20 minutes later, I sort of came to, and I was the only teenager in front of this room of 400 teenagers standing there like this. I opened my eyes, preacher man's halfway through his message, everyone's seated. I'm like, okay. (laughs) And I was undone. I was transformed in a way that's impossible for me to describe. It was a it was a total redo of my insides and my thinking and, and everything in a matter of 20 minutes, and I, I was stunned. And I couldn't even really talk for the rest of the night, kind of a, kind of a thing. Like, it powerfully impacted emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, totally undone. And I, I couldn't help but relate to some of these things that he's feeling. Because during these three days, which is a pattern, by the way, that echoes Jesus' time in the grave, Saul was dying to himself. God was peeling away all that stubbornness and pride and arrogance and self-sufficiency and anger and frustration and and the religious spirit he had. And all that stuff was getting stripped away. And God was doing a powerful internal overhaul in his life. Can you imagine someone of his stature and his personality to be struck blind and have to walk for three or four or five or six more days being led by someone? along the path, how humiliating would that be? How humbling. This situation was perfectly designed to take Saul and just break him down. Listen, sometimes God's going to do that in your life. He's just going to take you and start to break you down because it's exactly what you need, and it's an act of love. Sitting in a room for days, blind, disoriented, He was dying to himself in a way that would change him forever. And this is the way I think. I have to ask this question. Did Saul have a choice in the matter? Do you think? I I think he did. I think he did. I don't think he had a choice about whether he could go blind or not, right? God just did that. But his response to that, I still believe that he had a choice in that. In God's sovereign will, there was an eternal purpose, but one that didn't preclude Saul from letting go of his pride and arrogance and making that decision to submit himself to the purposes of God. So wait, Ryan, are you saying that God's sovereignty and free will could coexist? Yes, I am. Fight me. Okay, let's go on. Um, Now there was a, verse 10, now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, man, a lot of visions going on, Ananias, and he said, here am I, Lord. Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Now, I don't think that it was every day that Ananias experienced something like this. I don't think it was every day that he just woke up and laid in his bed until he got instructions from God about what to do. Anybody who likes to stay in bed a while? 
If anybody bugs you, just say, I'm waiting for the Lord. <laughs> okay? It's ammo. Was this guy an apostle? Was he, was he a prophet in like the Old Testament sense? Was he a, a rabbi or some spiritual giant? No. He's just a guy. He's just a follower of the way. And he's sitting at the feet of Jesus, his teacher. And he's doing that in a way that's a, that's a lifestyle. It, it dominates his thinking and his decision making. And it, he's obviously experienced the lordship of Jesus. But on this particular day... He gets some specific instructions. There are times when God will give specific instructions to you. And if you hear them, do them. It's not every day. I had a season in early, right when I came to the Lord, I was like, man, I'm going to live by faith. Lord, what cereal do you want me to eat? Should I go to class today or should I just, you know, like all these things I was just putting, it was kind of ridiculous. It was cute, you know. It was young. But, we don't have to live that way, but I tell you what, keep your antenna up because God will come and give you specific instructions sometimes. There was a family in Kurdistan where each member of the household had a separate dream that told them they should cross the river the next day. Listen, if you ever wake up and your entire family had the same dream, pay attention. <laughs> the next day, without hesitation, they all went and crossed the river and someone handed them a Bible. My point in telling you these stories is to say, is to address the part of our hearts sometimes that says, ah, it's Acts. It happened. It doesn't really happen that way. Now. It does. God is still giving us specific instructions to see his kingdom advance in this day and this time. This last week I was sitting working, busy, stressed. Anyone been there recently? And I felt like the Lord said, I, I stop and pray for some of your coworkers. And I happened to do it this time. That's why I'm telling the story. I didn't skip it, so I'm going to tell, tell the story. But I stopped. I prayed. He brought a couple of people to mind. I sent them each messages that I, think, that I thought the Lord was saying to them. One of them um, said, whoa, can we talk? And the thing that God had spoken to me was exactly what he was going through and really struggling with that day. And there's been a series of circumstances that had he was pretty upset. And he, as we talked, he realized that I hadn't talked to anyone else about it. I had just prayed, and God told me to say that to him. And you could see on the Zoom call, his wheels were turning like, wait a second. God is entering into my world. Specific instructions. A missionary we support, used to support here, uh, she was in Brazil, and she felt her and her team felt led to go to pray for the girls that are in a brothel. And they spent a bunch of time in prayer and, w and went over there. And she wrote in an email, she wrote, So when he arrived, we approached the guard about going inside to pray. And he quickly said that we couldn't do that. But I pressed him a bit, saying, No, we need to pray with Ariana, Sabrina, and Samantha. Three names that we heard from the Lord in prayer beforehand. He looked at us funny and then went in and got the three girls who came out even more confused than him. Whoa. Specific instructions to reach people for the Lord. It's still happening. I remember a, a visit to a village in India on a mission trip we were having, to, you know, where I felt let, I prayed during prayer in the morning. I just had this picture in my mind of, a, of fields of crops that were dead and rotting, and I felt led to specifically pray for men who were suicidal. When we got to the village later that afternoon, it turns out there had been a, a drought. The entire village had lost all their crops, and all the men were leading families who were starving, and they couldn't do anything about it, and they were beginning to despair. And so as I shared this thing from the Lord, they knew I didn't know any, anything about. Seven or eight Indian men stood up in that environment and said, I'm, I'm struggling. Some of them were suicidal. And I believe the Lord saved some lives that day. So all I'm saying is be aware God still gives specific instructions, not to spiritual giants and apostles and just pastory kinds of people. He speaks to all of us. Be aware of it. And if you happen to hear specific instructions, do them. 
Don't tell yourself God doesn't do this stuff anymore. And don't kid yourself that God couldn't use you, you specifically, in this way. Verse 13, but Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he's done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Wait, who's here? Saul is here? What's Ananias' natural reaction? Run, right? And not in a jokey sort of way, like, he's here in our town, and he's coming house to house. Run and hide. Your life is in danger, right? These are the emotions he's feeling. He has literally systematized his hatred, and he has the law on his side. He's got these documents. This man has done much evil to your saints, he says. This guy is evil. He cannot be reached. He is one of those that is just beyond. No, you don't understand what he's been doing. There are times when God calls us into a situation and he just serves up this heart that's ready to receive and it's this beautiful thing. There are times when God is going to call you to come alongside powerful enemies. I know this is going to be a little bit tough to imagine, but I want you to imagine someone you see as an enemy. A powerful leader who has done evil to your people and to your country, who's rejected Jesus and and systematized their hatred. I know it's hard. Just, Just work with me. has orders to arrest Christians who are meeting in whatever city they're meeting in and has support from the highest powers in the nation. Okay, maybe you have someone in mind. I'm just, just work with me. What if you were spending some time with God in your normal daily life of being a follower of the way and, doing, and listening to God and doing all that? And what if one day God said to you, hey, that person is in a hotel room on Main Street. And I want you to go down and I want you to lay hands on him and pray for him. Remember, this is a person maybe that in a certain situation, they could literally arrest you on site and ship you off and disappear you because of your involvement in Christianity. A person who has done great evil. You've already heard the stories about the people that have disappeared, the people that have been arrested. And God is saying, I want you to go to that hotel down in Grass Valley or in Auburn. I want you to go there and show up and I want you to pray for him. Would you do it? I mean, it's easy to sit here in these soft chairs and be like, yeah, man, of course, pastor. I mean, think about it, though. Would you do it? With that threat on your life, would you do it? Obedience in these cases requires courage and faith. God may call you to do that sometime soon. Prepare your heart for it. And ask for God's perspective, which is the truth. We all have a perspective about people, think certain judgments we make in perspective, but the truth is what God says about Saul is he is my chosen instrument. That's what he tells Ananias. This is a pivotal moment, one of the most intense conversions recorded in the New Testament. It's this, the giftedness of Saul had been hijacked by that religion and that pride of life, and God was reclaiming his own. And he's telling Ananias, I know what he's done. I know what you've heard. I know how you feel about him. He is a chosen instrument. What Ananias didn't know was that Saul would become Paul and whose ministry and influence heavily shaped the early church, right? 
and these writings that he ended up doing. He didn't know any of that. All he knew was the threat and the reality of what he was sitting in. And he was in his house, and about a mile away on Main Street was that guy. He had none of this context. Saul, who would write, let me just read the list of books in the Bible. Galatians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians. 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Romans, Ephesians, Philemon, Colossians, Philippians, 1st Timothy, 2nd Timothy, Titus, all written by the Holy Spirit through this man. What a pivotal moment. Have any of those books helped you understand God? Affected your life? Helped you understand who you are in Christ? And, it's the, and this is the moment where it, it unlocks. This is the doorway through which all those blessings come. And I'm so thankful for Ananias' obedience and his courage in that moment. He was living in that moment with his life in danger and he, and he believed God. Either that or he liked what God said, and I'll show him how much he must, he, how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. He's like, suffering? Great, I'm in. Verse 17, so Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. Two words hit me really hard as I prepared for this. Brother Saul. I want you to think about that. He called him Brother Saul. Considering all that he'd been through, all that he'd heard, all the pain, difficulty, injustice... After Jesus himself was killed by Saul's people, right? Saul, Gamaliel, Sanhedrin. These are the people that killed Jesus. After Stephen was killed in the street. Yeah, they didn't have authority to do any of that, but man, if a mob in the street stoned somebody to death, well, and they, threw, and they put their robes at this man's feet. After many... Godly men and women were taken from their own living rooms. Some were disappeared. Some were tortured in prison. And in spite of all of that and all the unanswered questions, this man got up out of his living room, walked out around the corner, down the street, all the way to Straight Street, walked into this place where this man he knew was there. And God did an amazing process in his heart, in his mind, on that walk to take him from, you are my enemy, to the point he could lay his hand on his shoulder and say, Brother Saul. Brother Saul. That's powerful. That's not natural. That's not something you can just talk yourself into. That's something you have to learn from Jesus. That's something you have to allow his Holy Spirit to empower in you as you go. Faith and works come together and God meets us and crazy things happen. Where did he learn that kind of forgiveness? Jesus hanging on the cross, sent there by the Sanhedrin, being tortured to death, says, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's where he learned it. Undoubtedly, this gesture, this prayer from one of the followers of the way was a perfect note in the song that Jesus was singing to Saul, weaving a whole new melody in his life. And it seems that he was already surrendered to the Lord at that point and, and was being filled with the Spirit. And he was immediately baptized. Can you imagine that baptism? Whoa. I actually think no one probably showed up. Like, 
It's a ploy. They're just trying to draw us out into the open. Everybody stay in your house. You're like, so that's what I'd be thinking, right? It's a manipulation. We're all about to get thrown in, you know, tied up. But man, Paul, Saul was just telling the world, I am changed. I am remade. I am publicly identifying. What an amazing transformation in such a short amount of time. Let me wrap up. Today we're looking into this significant event. And we see... God busting into his pride and his anger-filled heart, humbling him and remaking him, and reminded reminded that some of us stubborn ones, arrogant ones, need a loving slap upside the head. And that God does that because he loves you and he wants you, and he wants to reclaim you for his own. If God is coming after you recently and you're one of those, let me say this, bow your knee. Step into the blessing that God has for you. He has prepared good things in advance for you to do and to walk in. I actually just want to stop here and and ask if there's any of those stubborn ones. You're my people, don't get me wrong. You need to bow the knee. God's after you. He's slapping you upside the head in a loving way, and he's saying it's time to let go. It's time to bow the knee. And you are ready to do that today. He's just, I'm talking, and your heart's going and stirring, and it's, maybe it's for the first time. Maybe you've rejected Jesus before and the stupidity of it all or whatever you decided to tell yourself, and you know he's calling you. Maybe he's just been after you, Christian, and you've been resisting him and not doing what he's asking you to do. Is there anybody who would be courageous enough to put up their hand and say, hey, I'm there, I'm ready to bow the knee, I need some prayer? Yeah, all right, cool, there's one. Is there, was there one in the back there? Like, stretching, okay. That's cool. First service, there was like people pointing at each other. I was like, no, that's not the way this works. But they were just pointing me to someone I I had missed. So, Anybody else before we pray? Anybody just been stubborn up here? Okay, right on, right on. All right, well, let's pray. Join me in praying for those people who are ready to finally surrender. Lord, you, um, you don't give up on us. Sometimes, man, we just get stuck. We get stuck in our own thoughts. We get stuck in our own pride, our own perception of what's good and what's wrong and what's not. And we just, our hearts get hard. So God, I thank you right now that you have softened these hearts. And as they actively bow the knee, bend the knee, God, that you'd rush in right now with your affirmation, your closeness, your love, your forgiveness, that they would even sense that as you speak to them about how much you love them and that you have good things planned for them, but it needs to happen your way. I pray that you begin to speak to them about those things in the days to come, about what you're going to do and how and why, and that you give them a picture and remake them even as they surrender to you, that they would die to themselves in new ways today, right now, right now. There would be a death to themselves and a birth to the new things that you are doing. Protect them from the enemy that would whisper in their ear and say it's not worth it or it's not true. God, you're moving, you're calling them, and today they respond, and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. We see God involved in breaking the laws of nature. And we're reminded he's still doing that and giving in specific instructions to his followers. If you hear those instructions, act with faith and courage. And finally, we see a character in a heart in Ananias that can only be explained by a deep work of the Holy Spirit that enabled him to forgive and engage his powerful enemy in a powerful way. Allow God to give you his perspective on the people you have maybe good reason to hate. Allow him to work into your heart the words that he would speak over them, even though you've given up on them. They're too evil. 
And ask God for the powerful miracles where enemies become brothers, become family. Here's the thing as we go into communion. Remember, bread side first, okay? Bread side first. The scripture says we were all enemies of God. While we were still enemies, Christ died for us. So even as you sit and ponder the enemies in the scriptures and the enemies that you may perceive in your own life, in your own culture, in your own world, remember that while you were still an enemy, Christ died for you. And on that cross, when his body was broken, he said, forgive them. Take with me. And his blood, which is powerful enough to cover any sin, to purify even the most rebellious heart, to bring us into a new place of forgiveness and cleanliness before God. One that he has done for you if you're a follower of Jesus and one that he wants to do for many, many other people on this earth. Let's take As the worship team comes back up, let me just pray, close us out today. God, thank you for your word. And I just trust you, God, to unpack this for every heart in its own way, in their own time, that you would teach and instruct and correct and encourage and challenge them in only the way that you can. Thank you that you don't give up, that you didn't give up on Saul. Thank you that you didn't give up on me that you'd enter into our world and bring new life. God, thank you for the things you're doing in the church right now. We pray for more miracles and more growth and life. Not just our church, I'm talking the church. As difficulty comes, let us walk through it. And even as Ananias experienced uncertainty, instability, questions, things that were rocking his world, I pray that we would learn to live like he lived and to navigate with the same heart that you have given and shown to us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.